Hello and welcome to my channel. I'm Sylvia Isaacson and today's near-death experience interview is with Barbara Ireland. To give you some background and context, Barbara is an accomplished jazz singer who had these negative thoughts that were looping in her brain and she wanted to break free from it. So when she had the opportunity to sign up for this boot camp in the remote Northwest in Canada, she signed up and instead she ended up having a near death experience and a life review that she shares with us in this interview. If you resonate with this video and you're interested in supporting my channel, please like, comment, and subscribe. And also, Barbara has a book called Stop Negative Thinking, and I placed the link below. Thank you for watching. Welcome, Barbara. I'm going to get you on here. Here we go. Welcome. Hi, Sylvia. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here and to meet your beautiful, sunny face. Thank you. <laughs> Same to you. You're gorgeous. And when I watched your interview the one that I uh, thought oh my gosh I have to interview Barbara uh, you were so dynamic so I was excited to hear about it so um, without further ado can you tell us uh, where you were at the time that you had your near-death experience yes I was uh, in this extremely remote area that it was a camp where you go to you know, push your boundaries and develop courage and and break through your fears. And my whole goal there was to to get rid of some negative thoughts I had heard uh, several months earlier, just streaming through my head that I didn't even realize were still there. And so I thought, oh, I'll just get rid of them this way. So I go to this crazy camp, and it was a week long. It was every day terrifying and, you know, sleep deprivation, three hours a night, uh, no showers, thank God for deodorant, um, and just like heights and fire and really creepy people scaring you on purpose to see how you're going to respond and helping you to respond better. But it, it was, it was very hard. Every day though, I was getting through it really well until the last day. Did you know what you were getting into? I did not. They specifically don't tell you what's coming. Um, I gained actually so much from it though. If, even if, I mean, not even if, if I hadn't almost died, I would have left there going, you know, that was really useful and um, I'm really glad I went. I still feel it was really useful and I'm really glad I went, but for kind of different reasons <laughs> than I expected. Mm -hmm. And the, the sad thing about it is um, there were, it was a pretty harsh, harsh boot camp. It was a week long event and it was the last day. It was an endurance experience. And by then my, my whole body was, you know, pretty beat up, pretty tired from this whole thing. And my psychology was really heightened. Um, but I was ready to go. Here we go. We never know what we're going to be doing that day. And we set off. And now I find out it's an endurance thing. And it had to do with carrying bricks. And that's, I, I, I signed a disclosure form, so I can't really say what we did. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, I was going along and I had a teammate with me and everything was fine. And we got to the halfway mark. We had a little bit of a bite. I mean, this was miles and miles out in the sun. And we were coming back as fast as we could because it was timed. And suddenly things started going really haywire. And I started hearing reverberated sounds and people started like strobing like this and and light flashes and my legs were wobbly and I thought is this dehydration what's going on so I'm just guzzling water well um I don't even really know how I made it back because I thought I was going to be fainting for the last 20 minutes or something and when I got back all those sensory explosions were just in high alert and my psyche was in high alert and I sat down and I asked someone to get me a medic and 
I won't go into the whole debacle of getting a medic, but finally um, later someone did show up as a medic and the sweetest man ever, but he was not a medic, my friend. <laughs> and, um, and he was just terrified when he saw me. He took my blood pressure and did all that. And each reading he saw, he got more and more flipped out because that, that was the saddest part of this whole camp. Um, they were not set up for problems, uh, physical problems, which astounds me because we were doing so many dangerous things. Because what was going on, I later came to discover, was a combination of heat stroke, being out in that sun mm -hmm. for hours and hours. But more importantly for my body was something called hyponatremia, which is when you don't have enough salt in your blood. And I was drinking all that water. Mm. I thought I was getting dehydrated. I was sweating all week. So I was sweating out all the salt in my body. And when you don't have enough salt, your blood pressure just crashes. And there's been like marathoners that die from it during races because they're pushing so hard and they don't have enough salt in their body. And so it was terrifying to have both of these two physical things going on at once. And it was really stroke symptoms from the heat stroke that I was getting when all the weird uh, psychedelic, you know, sensory things were going on. So the, the man said, okay, the, the, the so-called medic said, let's put you back in your tent and let you just lie down. Well, it was a super hot day. I couldn't be in my tent. so. I elected to be under this astounding tree, astounding, beautiful tree. It just brings me tears to think of that gorgeous tree. It was kind of like my the thing I held on to. Sorry, I'm I'm a very much of a uh, highly sensitive person, so tears come. But um, especially after the near death experience. So I laid there under that tree, and thank God my best friend was with me, and she was holding my hand, and. As I laid there, I could feel my body shutting down. And it started with a limb, like a left leg. And I suddenly couldn't feel my left leg anymore. It was basically gone. And I started screaming about my left leg, then my right leg, same thing. Then my left arm, then my right arm. And I was just this torso and a head. And that's all I could feel of myself laying there. And, um, then I started feeling, Sylvia, the strangest sensation of this like air puffing out of the top of my head. And it was, oh God, I can't believe I'm so teary today, but it was my life force moving out of my head. And I'd, I'd read enough to think, is that really what's going on? Is this really happening? And right when I was tripping out about that, these movies started and that almost calmed me down. It distracted me. These movies were of my life. So these movies were like 3D um, uh, replays of my life, but I was both watching them and I was in them at the same time. So as I was watching them, I could observe what was going on. But while I was in them, as I was in them, I could still feel what it felt like at that moment. I could still remember the thoughts or feel, hear the thoughts and all the nuances of what was going on, the shadows, the person's, you know, the smells, everything of, of the room. And the first one that showed up was of a band rehearsal from like a few weeks earlier that I was having with my brother who I loved dearly, but we were having an argument and all of a sudden the movie stopped and this voice appears, not, not external, not my normal voice I hear in my head. It was a really calm male voice. And it said, what were you thinking right then? And I thought, and I answered it. And as soon as I answered it, the little movie flew off the image of like my screen of my eyes, inner eyes, and a new, a new movie started up from er earlier. And these movies 
kept playing and freeze framing and I was asked questions at every moment of a freeze frame. Now these freeze frames were super specific. It's like a movie that's playing and suddenly it stops right when I raise my eyebrow and it says, why did you raise your eyebrow right then? What were you thinking? And I thought, and I answered it. And again, it would go and it said, would stop right there. Why did you turn your head down? Look away, what were you thinking? Sometimes it would ask what I was feeling, but mostly about what I was thinking. And the funny part, Sylvia, is that a couple times I tried to lie and be a good girl and not say what I was actually thinking if it was like a judgment or <laughs> like mm -hmm. some criticism of someone else. And I said, tried to like cover that up. And the, the voice would say, are you sure that's really what you were thinking? They already knew, obviously. <laughs> and so <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, actually I was thinking blah, blah, blah. And so I, I learned I couldn't lie. Mm -hmm. This is what went on for four hours, as far as I can tell, because I knew when that, um, when we got back from the exercise we had done running, mm -hmm. and I knew when I had come out of it, because I asked my friend and I could see the sun coming down. So I knew it was about four hours of this. Oh. Meanwhile, while this was going on, that puff, was still going out of my head. And so at the very end, suddenly all the movies stopped and the voice said, Barbara, you now have uh, a choice to make. Would you like to stay or go? And I realized that meant, did I wanna leave my body 100%? And I, I, God, it, I was leaning towards leaving because as you've heard from so many near-death experiencers, not all of them, I know some of them have not had a good feeling, <laughs> but most of them had the feeling of this extraordinary, un indescribable love, sense of love on the other side. That's nothing like we feel here. This unconditional, literally unconditional love. Um, and boy, is that appealing. <laughs> and also I thought, you know, if I stay in my body, there's all sorts of hassles to deal with here. There's choices to make. There's relationships to mend. There's, you know, it, it's complicated here. Mm -hmm. There's physical pain. There's emotional pain. And I thought, but also there's so much joy here. There's the people I love. There's the things I want to do with my life. So I was debating this, and I, so I asked questions. We, we had a conversation at that point, and I, I decided to come back. And when I said, yes, I want to come back, immediately I started feeling that air going back into my head. And I was given specific instructions about four people I was supposed to see the following week and I had to see them. I had to set up appointments with, with each of them. One was phone calls, a little less like an appointment, but, um, and tell them how much I love them. Uh, again, the tears, oh, not just like, oh, you know, like my mom was on, not just, oh, mom, I love you. She knows I love her, but Sylvia, <laughs> Oh my God, the type of love where you're like, what has that person meant to you? What has that person, their presence in your life meant to you? The kind of love that makes you cry, you know? Yes. Um, that's profound love. And to be able to express it, Boy, you, you, you can't imagine how weirded out people get when you express profound love. Yes. Like the deep love. They're, everyone's like, holy crap, she's, you know, crying. She's, she's you know. And they're like, what do I say to that? None of none, the three people I had the appointments with, not one of them could look at me. And these were long, like hour and a half appointments. And they're like, literally like this the whole time and kind of glancing up and 
not knowing what to say because I'm telling them about a near-death experience and all the things that happened, they're just tripping out. And then I go into the love. Anyway, it was extraordinary. So that was just the very beginning of what was to occur after that experience. So that first month, Sylvia, was over the top incredible. The first month of coming back into my body, um, first of all, I didn't have physical hardships from my near-death experience. I, I didn't physically 100% die. I was literally, I could literally, during that experience, feel one foot in and one foot out. And there was this veil, and I could almost see through it. I could kind of see this light, and I could feel it mainly on the other side. And I was kind of drifting when I was making my choice. Um, so I didn't have the physical trauma that so many other people have. And then the rehabilitation, I got to come back into my body and freaking fly. You know, I mean, I was like, I, I could hear music through my entire body. It wasn't just in my head, ears anymore. It was like I could hear it in my toes. And I was eating food so slowly because the smells and the textures and the taste were just blowing my mind. Like it basically, I was re experiencing senses on a completely different level. And I feel like maybe this is what babies feel like, or mm -hmm. like toddlers when they're just here and they're. What is going on? What is a peach? Whoa. And they might touch it against their cheek, you know, and smell it and think, what is this? And the juice flowing. And that's how I felt. Wow. And I was in love with people. I was in love with the flowers. I was in love with the rain. I was in love with my bad dreams mm -hmm. <laughs> because I didn't have very many. Um, but I would wake up and go, wait a minute. A bad dream's a good thing because it means I'm alive. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling. I'm conscious. This is cool. Something's going on in my subconscious that's working itself out. Great. So everything was a tremendous, tremendous joy. And most of all, the whole reason I went to that camp was to get rid of these negative thoughts that had played out so loudly one night for me. I wasn't having worry. I wasn't having self-doubt. I wasn't having judgment, self-criticism, none of that BS. I was feeling good. And then, slowly, that started fading away. And slowly, normal life, which has to eventually probably come back, started seeping in. And I didn't hear music through my whole body anymore. In fact, I listened to it while I was doing something else. Um, I wouldn't smell every single flower on the block anymore because I had to get somewhere, you know, and I couldn't dilly dally. Um, I had to think about money. I had, I started worrying again about someone, which was my kryptonite. My worry was my main kryptonite. And I started hearing the dang negative thoughts again, the self-doubt, the self-criticism, the resentments, and, um, a lot, a lot, a lot of forgiveness happened because of my near-death experience, but I still have had and still have some resentments that I'm working through. And they all started coming back. And I was like, you gotta be joking. You mean, I went through that whole camp, I had a near-death experience, and I still have these stupid thoughts, this stupid <laughs> negative thinking. Mm -hmm. And that's that was the big turning point for me because at that moment, I sat down and I said, hold on. What was the common denominator of all those movies that were playing? All those questions that were asked me during those four hours of my life review. And that's when I realized they were all about my thoughts. All about the way I was thinking. About not just negative thoughts, but looping negative thoughts. The ones that get stuck in your brain and you can't get them out, like worry. And it's, you know, you go on with your day and you try to quit worrying about something and it comes back. 
and you're like, oh, what should I, what should I, it's like those, when you get songs, like terrible commercial jingles stuck in your brain. Right. It was like that, you know, mm-hmm. but they're negative thoughts. Yes. And yeah. And we, I think we all have them to whatever degree. Mm-hmm. And what I realized at that moment is that's what the, the life review, the primary teaching of that life review was about the power of my thoughts, of our thoughts, mm-hmm. to be used for good or for ill. And because it can work both ways. If I was looping on how much I love myself and how much I love the world and how you know healthy I am and all these things, you think that's gonna change my life? Mm-hmm. Heck yeah. Mm-hmm. But no, I was I was looping on that I was feeling depressed or that I was worried or that I wasn't good enough or all the crap, you know, that we go on, that goes on in our head mm-hmm. or my head. Um, and so that's when I dove into the research about thought, about how we think, about neural pathways, about what is depression, what causes anxiety, what's the connection between the thoughts and the body or the thoughts and the emotion, and how can I shift these looping thoughts, interrupt these thoughts, so that I'm actually creating a life I want. You know, we hear about manifesting or what I I much prefer calling it conscious creating Mm -hmm. because that's basically what we're doing all the time. We're just doing it unconsciously. And so we're creating things we don't want or I was creating things I didn't want. And as I started pulling the pattern of negative thinking out of my habits, of my thinking habits, and then starting to think consciously, what do I want? How can I replace these thoughts? Sylvia, my life transformed so dramatically. Mm-hmm. Some people say I just don't even see like, seem like the same person. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. Just really freaking happy a lot. Tell us what we can do today. Give us some steps, some guidance, and let us know what's in your book, your body of work is what I should say, for the world. What can we expect? How can we feel and be and think better? Couple things quickly that you can do is one, start moving your body. Your body it, it, when I've been, I was on antidepressants for years. I know what it feels like to be depressed and clinically oppressed. Um, by the way, after the near-death experience and my de-looping, I'm not on antidepressants. I was, got off them years ago. But, and it, that's not like, whoa, great me. I, I'm, I'm okay with antidepressants. I think they save people's lives. Anyway, if you're depressed, Start, move, get out of your bed, get out of your home, move your body, however you want to do that. You can walk, you can, you know, kind of dance. If you can dance to some music, just even move your feet, just start moving your body. It will change how you're feeling. I guarantee it. And the second thing is all pain, physical physical problems, mental, emotional, is stems from a closed heart. That doesn't mean it's, you know, a broken arm has, you know, obviously a broken arm is a broken arm or schizophrenia is schizophrenia. But the very beginning seed of why the arm is broken or why the schizophrenia may have come to somebody is stems from a closed heart. And I'm just saying what I heard. I, I, some people may go, I don't believe that. That's fine. But I'm just letting you know. There are, if you, I, I put three alerts on my phone that come up throughout the day to remind myself to open my heart. Because it said, if you learn to start opening your heart, you'll be healthier. You'll be less depressed. You'll be less anxious. You'll have less loops. You'll be nicer to people. And 
I would also add to that the process of me, what I call de-looping, mm -hmm. um, you know, stopping that the negative cycle is also part of that unfolding of beauty in my life. And um, I was saying earlier about making the unconscious negative thoughts conscious and how that's such an important step because we don't even know we're thinking this stuff. And Carl Jung had an amazing quote. He said, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will, um, what's the word? It will drive your life and you will just call it fate. Mm -hmm. And the whole, I, the whole concept of consciously creating or manifesting um, a life we want, that is much more where my work is leading now. Because how I see growth, there's two the motivation for or, or growth comes from the motivation of two different things. Either we're moving away from something, like I'm moving away from negative thoughts. I'm, uh, you know, in AA, they move away from alcohol. I'm moving away from a toxic relationship, or I'm moving towards something. I'm moving towards a vision for my life. I'm mo moving towards health, whatever it is. And so, my work really is about both these things. My book is about moving away. How do you get rid of this pattern of negative thinking? Get them out of your life and like clean the closet so you can start adding the things you want in your life. And my, my, that's, that's the freaking fun part. You get to figure out what do you want for your life? And they, you know, I, I heard a, I read a, some research that said, one in a hundred people actually know what they want. And, you know, you can say, yeah, I want love. I want success. I want health. Yeah, but what kind of love? Mm -hmm. What kind of success? What kind of health? What does that mean? When you get into the nitty gritty, it's so fun. It's like, you know, you can't build an award-winning house unless you have the blueprint for it. They have great plans for it. You got to know what you want. So. Um, my work really is about how to de-loop the negative thoughts, the old programming, and then how do you consciously start creating something you really, really want. When a individual is happier, when they're living a more fulfilling life, when their heart is softening, when they're not looping so much, when they're not criticizing themselves, when they're loving themselves more, when they're having money, they don't have debt, like all the things, inner and outer, they are nicer. Mm -hmm. They are kinder to people. They're more compassionate. They're more generous. They're more empathic toward other uh, towards other people. They're more giving. And so the whole, this world needs compassion, kindness, generosity. And so love. And so, yeah, my work really is about a global thing, like one person at a time gets happier, even by 10% at a time. Imagine the ripple effect. They're nicer. We're nicer to other people when we're happy. <laughs> I mean, like in relationships. For sure. You know, we're willing to share more. And so, boy, this world needs it desperately, desperately. I know that the hour went by real quick, but uh, yeah. <laughs> it's over. Is there a last bit of um, loving, compassionate advice that you could give us? I created, I'm almost done creating a really beautiful three session course. And it's um, about what we talked about, removing three of the top blocks, unconscious blocks that we have towards conscious creating, creating a life that we want. Um, my book goes into detail about the steps to stop the looping. And this course specifically goes into three top blocks. It's totally free if anyone would like to check out what I have to say about that. And I'm really excited to share that. Because, like I said, one happy person at a time. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, I'll put that link below too. And I encourage people who want to learn more about this topic. And if you enjoyed this interview to check that out. All right. Well, thank you so much, Barbara. I want to acknowledge you, Sylvia, for the incredible, incredible work you are doing. And I'm going to get tears again just because it's the end of the interview and why not? Thank you. I mean, you are a freaking bright spirit. And I'm really, really feeling this today with you more than when I was watching because of you. now I'm feeling your energy here. And you, the combination of what you hear and your dreams, those intense dreams that you have and that you hear God in your ear and then you share that with people combined with um, interviewing people that have messages that can also help this world. Your work is tremendous. It's transformative. And I want to acknowledge you for the effort you're putting into this. And thank you so, so much. Oh, and I'm so happy that to be on your, your You brought me to tears. Thank you, Barbara. 